，哎，各位都知道，上半年我们出现了一个很严重的攻击事件，叫做 “Wanna Cry”， 然后就想哭。那呃，大家其实也都知道，这个 “Wanna Cry” 是透过 MS 零七零一一这个 SM SMB 的 Explorer Windows Explorer， 那那这个这个 Windows Explorer 它是从美国 NSA 流出来的军火，就是呃，从去年开始有一个事件，就是美国其实就是有一些相关单位，他已经开始研发数位军火，这是第一起数位军火外泄造成民间受害的案例。那么，呃，其实我有问过尼克老师，他其实对于这个。这些细节，什么 NSA， 它其实是不能讲的。但是呢，对于细节的部分，像是你怎么确认这个漏洞的技术细节，它都有在这个演讲里面会提到。那呃，各位如果有兴趣的话，这一场演讲是非常值得听的。好，那我们掌声鼓励 n i c o l a s 嗯，谢谢大家。我非常高兴，其实，说实话，坐在这里，面对你。所以，我听说过 “Wanna Cry”， 我想，所以，我听说过这个词，所以，我非常能理解。他说的对，我将说到 SMB 今天。但，各位，请不要误会，我不会放弃任何一天在这里。我不想被炸。All right, let's start that.、Um, yep, that works. I can't believe that I'm doing this presentation on a MacBook. <laughs> That's that shouldn't happen. So、uh, let me take some time so, to introduce myself. So who am I? Well, I'm Nicolas Jolie. I used to be、uh, an exploiter. So、uh, I now work at Microsoft. But before that, I used to work、uh, for a company. That you might know, guys.、Uh, it's called ViewPen. It was called ViewPen. So、uh, we were doing exploits. We were doing some vulnerability research,、um, doing some zero days. <laughs> And、uh, I do remember one day、uh, that was in CanSequest. So before I joined Microsoft. And I was uh, standing. I was uh, sitting uh, at a table. And there was one guy from Microsoft、uh, right in front of me. And he told me, Nico, we've never met. You don't know me, but I know your work really, really well. <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not very sure about what you're talking about, but、uh, in it. So now, so yeah, I'm now working for Microsoft, so the MSRC, so Microsoft Security Response Team.、Uh, so what are we doing there?、Uh, well, we solve crises.、Uh, Well, it's not only about、uh, solving crises, but uh, well, uh, crises uh, happens from time to time, and typically、uh, with、uh, the kind of stuff that I'm going to talk about. You no, know? but yeah, we are more like focusing, or、uh, actually, in my team, on anything that has to do with exploit、uh, vulnerabilities,、uh, writing mitigations,、uh, just to make it hard for you guys, so that your next exploit will take. Probably forever. We'll see. I'm quite confident about that. <laughs> so, I'd like to start this story、uh, again from、uh, Twitter, as always. So, I do remember that day.、Uh, that was a Friday in April.、Uh, I was again、uh, in traveling、uh, in Asia, in South Korea. And、uh, so for that conference,、so、whose name is ZeroCon, so it's about zero days, of course. And so that was on Friday night. So we were going to a restaurant, and I quickly checked Twitter, and you know, on my feed there were like stuff about、uh, these guys, so shadow brokers. So just uh, just a quick question, guys: How many of you I've I've heard about WannaCry or the shadow brokers? Any? Anybody? All right, not many people.、Um, so yeah, so checking my Twitter feeds.、Uh, so apparently, yeah, there was a release of like several exploits、uh, just、uh, dropped to the public. So、uh, I didn't have anything with me. So quite hard、uh, to just assess if it's true, if it's false. And I was like, 
Okay, so that's probably synonym of a crisis coming up from the MSRC. And then uh, another tweet like 30 minutes later uh, saying, yeah, it's about uh, zero days and probably affecting the SMB protocol. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> not again. And then uh, a few hours after, uh, one guy, a, a British guy, uh, on Twitter again saying, oh God, it's going to be a bloodbath. There's, there's exploits, they do repo on the latest versions of Windows. And when I saw that tweet, I found that is not possible. What did we miss? What did I miss? That shouldn't be, that shouldn't happen like this. And so uh, I went to sleep. And then on Saturday morning, I checked my Twitter feeds again, and there was that blog post from uh, Philip Miner from the MSRC saying that uh, the team uh, during the night, my night in South Korea, had taken time to review all of these exploits, and it turned out that most of them had been fixed. So this is, I'm going today to talk about the SMB exploits. Uh, some of these exploits affected, uh, for example, exchange. Yeah, I won't be talking about that, uh, only SMB. So these exploits were indeed fixed. Um, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about a fix that was released in March. Uh, so as you can see on that slide, so there were six vulnerabilities. Uh, five of them were critical. Uh, the last one was an, an info disclosure vulnerability. So, so yeah, uh, I mean, I've heard about these bugs uh, in at some point in 2017. Uh, actually, I was on vacation because it's always about that when this kind of thing happened, and I was skiing in France in the Alps and quickly checked my emails. And apparently, there was some stuff going on about SMB. And you, you know, guys, I used to be a, well an exploiter at Viewpen, like mainly working on Flash or JavaScript or this kind of thing. And SMB, yeah, I have like I had no experience with that. But uh, I read this, the, that thread, and, um, and I, well, it sounds quite interesting. So, so let's let's talk about that uh, more uh, into detail. So, for this presentation, uh, I'm going to talk about the vulnerabilities uh, that were used by these eternal exploits. Uh, I talk about also how these exploits work. Uh, I will mention uh, or mitigations from, for Windows 10. And then uh, in the end, I will be talking about some of the research we did alongside, uh, like some of our bugs we fixed. So let's start with probably the most famous one, the eternal blue. Um, so why do I say that this is the most famous one? Um, because for some reasons, uh, this was the exploit that was adapted and ported to WannaCry. Don't ask me why they choose this one in particular. I have no idea. I don't know. Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> so this, uh, this exploit was abusing a vulnerability, an integer wrap, uh, so what is that thing? So just on these slides, I've put uh, the relevant snippets so that you guys can have a good idea of what uh, this is really about. Um, so yeah, so integer wraps. So what is that thing? Uh, so usually when we've got uh, this kind of vulnerability, um, you, you, if you talk to me about an integer app, I will be thinking about you know uh, some bugs in a, in, a, in an image parser. Like typically, you're you're dealing with a JPEG or a GIF image, so the sizes, the dimensions of that picture are hold on two bytes, and uh, and an attacker has put uh, I don't know a width, for example, so he has set it to zero uh, x fff. And then, uh, for some reason, the parser, uh, well, the renderer is going to allocate that uh, 0x FFFF plus 1, which is going to wrap on uh, 16 bits. And then there will be an allocation, and then uh, an allocation of 0, probably. And then uh, data will be returned to that buffer, causing, of course, a, a heap overflow, and then uh, triggering remote code execution, etc., etc. In that case, uh, this is a bit different. Um, so. As you can see uh, on, on this picture, uh, there is that function, with, well, that's not a function, that's a macro, which is pointer diff short. So uh, what is this about? So let me first introduce you to two structures. Uh, 
this one, so this FE, FEA list, FEA list uh, which, uh, which is supposed to embed several EA items. Um, on, on the structure on your left, uh, you can see that uh, these, uh, these FEA items are, well, there are very something missing here, but basically uh, these FEA items, they contain uh, these three members plus two other buffers. So their, uh, their size can actually vary. So what this bug is all about? Um, this, is, this is about processing a list of items uh, this is about pre-processing, sorry, a uh, list of items uh, in order to determine a size, to locate data, and then write to that buffer. Uh, so how does that work? Uh, so I, well, the source code is quite big, so I didn't want to put it there, so I just passed a, a screenshot from, from Ida. Uh, it shows that there is a loop, and that loop is actually iterating for all these elements uh, in, that, in that list, and uh, it's assessing their size. So usually when we talk about uh, the SMB v1, so that uh, all protocol, we are talking about messages that shouldn't be more that uh, more than 10,000 bytes uh, in X, uh, so very small messages. So in most circumstances, uh, this function will just uh, behave fine. But uh, as we are talking about exploits and vulnerability, uh, we are, of course, talking about edge cases. So what happens there? Um, so let's assume that somebody sends a massive packet, uh, so a packet containing more than uh, 10,000 bytes. So that function that I just uh, showed you uh, at, the, at the slides before is going to loop, uh, to process all these items and determine a size. Deter it's going to, um, to determine the last uh, items that is valid in that packet. So basically, you're, you're sending a packet to a server, and, uh, and you're telling the server that there is, I don't know, like uh, 20, 20,000 uh, bytes in that packet. So the server is going to just check if you're telling the truth, and it will accurately calculate uh, the amount of data needed. And of course, here is where the bug stands, because if you've got enough data, you're going to wrap that counter. And so uh, that, because of that integer wrap, uh, the server is going to believe that there is actually more data than there is. Uh, and it, so it's going to allocate a buffer according to a size, but then there will be a loop that, that is bounded by the last uh, valid element. And since, since because of that bug, that last valid element is going to be outside of, uh, of scope. And so we hit uh, direct uh, buffer overflow conditions. So uh, yeah, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, you just allocate data, and then you, rest, you write past the bounds, and, and that's it. <laughs> and, uh, so a, a stupid bug. Um, how did, did they disguise exploit it? Um, I believe. You know, I've seen exploits in my life <laughs> so far, and I do believe that uh, the guys who did that are quite smart. Um, <clears throat> you know, if I had to exploit that thing, uh, I would think about uh, abusing uh, an object directly into uh, SRV.sys, that SMB1 uh, library. These guys, they did it a bit differently. Instead, they used uh, some object populated by SRVNet, uh, and these objects are created, actually, when you create a connection to uh, port 445. So when you send a scene packet to port 445, um, the server is going to allocate uh, a new MDL, so a memory descriptor list, um, object in uh, in the pool, and uh, it's going uh, to like initialize some structure there, and that's where the fun begins. Because um, these guys, what they did was uh, to sculpt the heap so that their buffer, 
uh, which the, well, they are going to sculpt the pool. Let me use pool instead of hip here. Uh, so that that buffer that they were going to overflow would be placed right before um, there's MDLs. And then uh, after triggering that overflow, they would overwrite uh, one MDL with some control data. And um, this is yeah, where it gets interesting. Because how, how do you exploit that? Well, it, it turns out that this MDL contains a pointer that, uh, that can be used to write the data received by the connection. On this picture that you can see on the screen, um, the second part is just about sending data uh, to these uh, these connections. So what happens? Um, so we are allocating an MDL, and then we are overflowing on it, and then uh, we are like just using some pointers in that MDL to write data to uh, well somewhere in memory. But since now that data has been overwritten, we are now able to write uh, some data uh, arbitrary. Uh, to, sorry, to an arbitrary um, uh, location in uh, in memory, and uh, and yeah, so yeah, this of course uh, runs uh, with kernel in the kernel, so with the highest privileges, so it's pretty much uh, game over. So what did these guys do? Well, actually, it was quite straightforward for them. So this exploit only worked up to Windows Seven. And on Windows 7, uh, the HAL region is uh, can be executable, so uh, it can be executed. So what they did was just uh, they abused that uh, that arbitrary right to send their payload to a uh, read write execute uh, memory page, and just have uh, another function pointer overwritten in that structure in that MDL structure to uh, hijack the execution flow. Um, yeah, that works. On Windows 7, at least it works. It doesn't work on other systems, but on Windows 7, yeah, I have to say that this works. And um, so is it why uh, this exploit was adapted to WannaCry? Yeah, perhaps, because it's quite simple. Um, so there was uh, one guy who tried to, uh, and actually who managed to exploit it uh, for Windows 8. I'm not sure exactly why he did that, but on Windows 8, it, uh, the system behaves a bit differently, so this uh, high region is not executable, so the guy had to, to trigger that bug twice, so first uh, to set the NX bit uh, to zero, and then uh, trigger again the bug, well, just uh, to, uh, to, uh, to have the same behavior. Um, I haven't seen any, uh, I don't think I've seen any successful port of this particular vulnerability on the latest Windows 10 versions. Uh, but I believe it could be, could be potentially doable, um, but that would be quite a challenge. How this thing was fixed? <clears throat> well, as I show you in my first slides, uh, all, this, all, all this had to do with that uh, pointer diff short thing. So it's quite it's quite weird to see uh, to see that macro. Uh, I mean, pointers <laughs> even on a 32-bit system, they should be on 42-bit. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, so. The fix for that was quite straightforward. We just uh, changed that pointer short, pointer diff short to pointer diff, and instead of writing a short, then we write a long, and uh, and that that works. Um, is there any other places where this vulnerability could have been found? Uh, so there was another function very similar to uh, that function that I can't pronounce the name. Uh, yeah, it was fixed as well. Uh, is there any other? Uh, function that use this, uh, not that I'm aware of. So we should be safe. Wow. Let me talk now about Eternal Champion. Um, so this one was about abusing some race conditions. So this one is quite cool. <clears throat> race conditions. So what this is about? Um, this one is about abusing transactions. Um, so let me first talk about some transactions. Uh, so in SMB1, uh, you've got three types of transaction. Um, yeah, anti-transaction, trans-transactions, and transactions too. 
So how does the, this thing work? So basically, uh, you've got your client and you're talking to a server, so you send a transaction request and the server is going to reply with a transaction re response. Yeah, that's quite simple. <laughs> um, that transaction request, uh, it has several fields. Um, so on this field, you, for example, specify the amount of data that, uh, that, you're, uh, that you're embedding. You specify the number of parameters that this packet uh, contains. You specify uh, the number of setup bytes also. So this is all for uh, some internal use um, for SMB. And it is also said in the specification that if your transaction packet is too large, um, then you can use some secondary transaction packets. And in that case, it's quite simple as well. You send a primary transaction request, server says, okay, send me more. And, and then you send uh, the other one. So, how do you specify that you need more packets? Well, there is a field in the transaction object, which is called max, there are two fields actually. Uh, these are called max parameter count and max data count. And so basically, if uh, data count uh, is different from max data count, or if parameter count is different from max parameter count, then uh, the server will know that uh, more requests Need, uh, need to be sent by a client uh, to process a transaction. That's quite simple, that's how it works. And then goes the funny thing. <clears throat> what, what happens if, if right after the first transaction, then we send an unexpected uh, secondary transaction. Let's say that uh, we have one transaction uh, with a data count equal, oh, I said some nonsense. It's not max parameter count or max data count. It's total data count and uh, total parameter count. I come back to, uh, to the others uh, later. But yeah, so basically you've got a primary transaction and you've got data count uh, equal total data count. And now the client said a second, a second transaction, so a secondary transaction. Uh, this one is unexpected with uh, another data count. So it turns out that the code uh, in, the, um, in, the server, in the secondary transaction is quite robust, I'd say. At least you cannot have like a stupid buffer overflow. I mean, for example, specifying uh, a data count uh, which is greater than total data count. Yeah, the server is going to reject that. But what the server does not is validating whether or not uh, that that primary packet uh, should be completed. So, which means that uh, if you send a secondary transaction uh, and that the first packet has already data count sent to, uh, set to total data count, yeah, the server just won't care and it's just going to increment that data count. Uh, and here is the bug. <clears throat> So you end up with the primary transaction being executed while data are still being appended to that uh, first transaction. How did these guys exploit that? <laughs> this is, uh, if you take a Wireshark pack, uh, capture of, uh, of this exploit, you'll quickly see that uh, it starts with a funky packet. Uh, so this, this TCP packet, it embeds uh, eight SMB, I think. Uh, the first one is a primary transaction for the empty rename function. So I talk more about this function later, but this function basically does nothing. It just, it's like the SMB echo function. You send data to it and it will reply with the same data. So this is the first SMB. The second SMB is a secondary trans transaction, uh, one that is not expected. And all the other SMBs are just to create uh, some transactions in the pool. So what happened? <clears throat> the thing is that these guys, they were quite clever, quite smart in the way they did that. Because their first transaction, uh, it is set to contain more data uh, that the server can just handle in one request. Uh, I'm, I'm saying here that the server will need 
to send at least two responses uh, to complete that transaction. This is because the buffer is too large. <clears throat> so the server, uh, when, it, um, when it gets that first entry rename request, uh, it's, it is just echoing uh, the first transaction. And then it sees that uh, the, this, uh, this request has more data than what uh, that what the, the request uh, the response can contain. So it's just going to queue up uh, another um, request, another response in uh, in another thread. And this is where the rest condition happens because on the second SMB there is a, a secondary transaction that is going to increment that that account. So when we enter uh, the, the code that is responsible for parsing that secondary transaction, we are going to increment a field called in data. And also, uh, we know, sorry, we are going to increment uh, that field uh, called data count, and then we write data uh, to, uh, to the in data buffer. But this, we don't care. The only thing that matters here is the fact that we are incremented in data because this uh, um, data count, because this data count will be used in the end in SMB, uh, a, complete, a complete execute transaction to uh, fill the second, uh, the second uh, response. And this is where these guys manage to leak memory because uh, so initially you have, you have your in data buffer which is uh, pointing to a valid location in the transaction object, and then you increment the data count. So now the server has just no idea that it's going to leak memory, and this is exactly what happened. So these guys, they exploited that, uh, that issue uh, first to leak memory. And yeah, on that picture, you can see what they leak. Basically, uh, some pool headers, so to know uh, whether, uh, well, to know the architecture of the server, and also some pointers, uh, well, for the next step. So what is the next step? Yeah, this bug is not only about leaking information, it's, it's on RC. Um, so it's where it gets a bit more interesting. Uh, there are some functions, well, in SMBV1, there are like tons of, of functions that you can reach uh, f with just uh, one transaction. Uh, so there is one, which is uh, that query path information function, which is using uh, that in data field. Uh, and actually, it's resetting it to a stack buffer. And that's quite bad, because in this case, when we are eating the secondary transaction, we are going to use that in data buffer again to write data. We didn't, uh, take, we didn't care about that when we were leaking memory, but here we do care about that, because when we are going to use that in data buffer, we are just going to write data to the stack. And uh, this, this does not make any sense. This should be pointing to a pool. So we end up with a nice stack corruption, which uh, can be abused, of course, to execute arbitrary code. So the, the fastest way is, uh, of course, to uh, overwrite a return address uh, on the stack and have it pointing like somewhere, uh, somewhere in the pool. On Windows 7, uh, it doesn't make uh, any difference. The pool is executable, so you can just return anywhere and have your shell code executed. And that's it. Uh, again, that's quite a simple exploit, quite a reliable one, and uh, yeah, and quite a disastrous bug <laughs> as well. So how did we fix that thing? Um, the fix for this one is a bit complicated because uh, these, these transactions, they are just all over the places. So what we ended up was to uh, define, well, to use uh, that execute flag for a transaction. And so whenever a transaction would be executed, we would uh, set that execute flag so that in case a secondary transaction would come, uh, we would see that uh, this execute flag is already set, so we should just drop it. That was uh, a part of the fix. Another part was to add lock pretty much uh, everywhere in the code, so that to be sure that no other race condition can happen. So typically, you've got a lock on a connection object, and uh, each time that lock is set, then you can be sure that there won't be any other thread uh, writing data or using this uh, transaction. 
I hope that this fix will be robust. We'll see. Let's talk now about uh, another one, eternal romance. Uh, this one was abusing two separate vulnerabilities. I quite like this, this exploit. So the first one was again uh, an information leak. <clears throat> so uh, we are again talking about transactions here. Uh, that's at the very heart of, uh, of all these exploits. So this, this, uh, this memory leak um, happens when you send a transaction and uh, you, you try to read some bytes from a pipe. So there is in, in a code for um, uh, SRV uh, pick name pipe, sorry, restart pick name pipe, there is, there is something at the end that specifies uh, how much data is available in the pipe. And what went wrong here is that we failed at checking whether that uh, amount of data was actually fitting in the transaction object. So uh, in the transaction object, you've got a pointer which is called out data. And uh, uh, the response, so the packet returned by the server would take that pointer and would copy uh, that account uh, bytes uh, from this pointer and send them to uh, to the client. So since we are not validating that that account, um, this is where uh, the max that account that I was uh, talking about uh, earlier uh, came uh, comes into action. So the client is actually specifying uh, the, the amount of byte that it can uh, handle. And so in this exploit, for example, it was set to one. Uh, uh, so which means that only one byte uh, could be read uh, should be uh, sent by the server. This, 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 of course, didn't work. And uh, what happens is that instead, well, the server would just leak memory, starting at uh, some crazy offset in a, in a, in a, in the transaction um, object. So uh, I was mentioning, I was talking about a crazy offset. Why is that? Uh, so these guys, what they did is that they specify the max parameter count uh, to be set to zero um, x five thousand four hundred. Uh, and why that number? Well, uh, it turns out that uh, when we allocate a transaction object, uh, there is some code that that checks how much data we want to allocate. And this transaction object, uh, they are like the perfect target for an attacker because there's there's objects they can be as big as you want. Uh, and these guys, so they, they specify that max parameter count uh, to that value so that uh, the in-data buffer would, be, uh, would point at the very end of the packet. And since uh, the size of, uh, the minimum size of a transaction is almost about this value, so that would lead uh, the server to uh, read data at, after uh, the bounds of, uh, of the transaction object. So here we've got our memory leak again, and we are able to leak data, uh, the architecture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <clears throat> Let me talk now about the second bugs, and that's quite my favorite one. Uh, this one is disastrous. So uh, before that, let me talk about uh, this, uh, this request, this write and X uh, request. So uh, with this request, uh, you're normally supposed to write data to a file, to a pipe, or something like this. And according to a specification, uh, if you've got a lot of data, you can split this, uh, this request into several. And so how does that thing work? Um, it's pretty much the same with transaction. You, you've got this field, uh, total data account, and, uh, and uh, you, you've sent uh, data account. You see that data account is lower than total data account, so you know that uh, more packets are coming. And how uh, the server uh, can find that packets? Let's say that you send like five uh, different write and X requests, all of them requiring uh, more data. So uh, what happens is that the server is going to use a function which is called uh, SRV find transaction, uh, based on several information found in the packet. And this is where uh, things uh, go wild. 
uh, there's this uh, find uh, SRV find transaction. It's also used in uh, in the transaction request. So in the case of the write annex request, where when we write data. To, um, to the transaction object, we are using the in data pointer. But in this, in these particular cases, we are each time we receive some data, we are incrementing the in data pointer, and this is where things go bad. Because uh, if you look at the code for uh, that under the secondary transaction, you'll see that instead the in data pointer is always uh, a remains the, remain the same. Which means that we can have a transaction crossover, this is uh, how we call it, where you have a write annex request followed by a, a secondary transaction that will be abusing that uh, in data pointer. And uh, this, is, this is disastrous because now you're able to write data out of bounds of the, the transaction object. And the crazy thing about this is, of course, the offset can be controlled. So you've allocated your object in the pool, and you're able to write data basically anywhere after that. So it's, it's a really interesting bug in terms of uh, writing an exploit. So how did these guys exploit it? <clears throat> well, um, if you try to exploit that bug, uh, you'll soon figure out that it's really, really easy to have a write an arbitrary write primitive. This is because uh, transactions object have been made so such that there is a pointer uh, to the in data uh, object uh, written at uh, at a particular offset there. So if you uh, if you spray the pool with several transaction objects and you happen to override that pointer then you'll be <laughs> typically able to write data at an arbitrary location when you send a secondary uh, request to, uh, to the transaction object that has been overwritten. Um, regarding uh, more of uh, their exploit, uh, there, is, yeah, there is something that I'm not very sure of, is that these guys, they used uh, a sequence of three different transactions uh, to, uh, to, to, to exploit that, that issue. Uh, two are enough. Uh, trust me about this. <laughs> Uh, so these guys, uh, the difficulty actually here is to get uh, an arbitrary read primitive. And what these guys did, they first overwrote uh, the in data buffer of uh, a, a second transaction in the pool. And then they used that second transaction to override the out data buffer uh, uh, pointer of a third transaction in the pool. Well, that works. Uh, in the end, you would just be able to reference that third transaction to read data uh, anywhere in a pool. And yeah, the, the, that indeed works. But it just required an additional transaction. I'm not sure exactly why they did that, but in the end, <clears throat> it works. So uh, what uh, once they had that uh, read and write primitive, what did they do? Uh, again, we are uh, talking about uh, Windows 7 here. Um, we'll talk about another exploit uh, later, but uh, this this thing was just about like finding um, a read-write and executable section uh, somewhere in memory. So yeah, so what in on Windows Seven you don't have anything like this. So what these guys what these guys did was just to reference uh, somewhere in the pool that would be of course, executable, put their data here, and, and that's it, and job done. The only thing that is, uh, let's say, uh, remarkable is that to trigger their payload, they, instead of just, like, I don't know, for example, overwriting a stack pointer or something, uh, they instead overwrote a pointer in an array of a function in a dispatch table, so that uh, with a particular SMB request sent to a server, they would be sure uh, that they would get uh, code execution. So that that was um, that was quite uh, a good exploit. <clears throat> yep. So yeah, I just talk about all of this. <clears throat> Hold on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was not. I was. 
yeah, sorry guys. <laughs> so let, let's talk now about uh, eternal synergy as the last one. So this one actually doesn't use any uh, any over vulnerabilities. So what you can quickly see when you do a Wireshark capture is that uh, the first uh, packets are sent just to trigger the memory that we see that we saw in Eternal Champions. So uh, again, they use that race condition, which is uh, quite um, quite reliable to leak memory, and uh, and that's it. Their next. Uh, the next step was to get uh, the RC, remote code execution, and for that they used the exact same bug as Eternal Romance. The only difference between uh, Eternal Romance and this one, Eternal Synergy, is the target. On this one, these guys, they wanted to target Windows 8. And on Windows 8, the pool wasn't uh, made exploitable. So they had to figure out um, a different way to execute uh, their code. But uh, it turned out that on Windows 8, uh, the anti-binary, you, you can see that there are some uh, read, write, and execute sections uh, in it. So what they did was just use, abuse that uh, read and write primitive that they had just to write their data uh, to that section. And then, yeah, that, that was, um, that was um, the remaining was exactly the same. They overwrote a pointer in the dispatch uh, table and then, yeah, that was it. You just uh, send a park circle request to that server, and you've got your, you got your code execution. So, yeah, quite a good exploit as well. None of these exploits worked directly on Windows 10. And um, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm an exploiter, so I, I thought I would have preferred to see something like this, uh, I mean, uh, a cool exploit for Windows 10 is not something that you see uh, every every day. But on Windows 10, uh, and specifically on the latest versions, we've got several mitigations uh, that make this exploit fail uh, by default. So, for example, all these um, features like uh, executing data in the pool. Yeah, this this is gone. This doesn't work anymore. So uh, I know that you guys are hackers, and I believe that if you have, if you know about something like this, like how to make the pool executable or how to find like some read write and execute section somewhere in the kernel, you should probably report it to us because I believe that it might qualify for the bounty um, uh, submissions, and you get of course a reward for that. Um, the other thing that I quite like is now that we've got a kernel CFG. So uh, you cannot just overwrite like a pointer in a dispatch table and just have it executing. Uh, yeah, that, that won't work. Uh, the system won't let you do that. Uh, you can always try to bypass it, uh, but yeah, you probably spend some time on it. And then, yeah, the last mitigation that uh, I'm going to talk about is the fact that on Creators 4, so which is uh, which will be released later this year, uh, SMB v1 will be disabled by default. So yeah, uh, we don't want any more this protocol. This doesn't mean that we are not going to support it. We do care about this. Uh, if you if you've got some bugs, we will fix them. But we are just going to deprecate it. Uh, this, these things date back from so long ago. Yeah, it's time to move to something. Yeah to something more secure. <clears throat> so what else uh, did we do? So I just focused uh, so far on six bugs that we've received. Um, when I saw the six bugs, I was like, oh, there must be others. It's, <laughs> it's not possible. These bugs, they, are, they were so critical. Uh, yeah, there, there must be others in the code. So we run, uh, we did some research on that code, so I was absolutely not familiar with that. And in the end, uh, I believe that we fixed 20, uh, something like that. So on the next slides, I'm just going to show you a few of the bugs that we fixed. So I start with a, a pull overflow in uh, that create options uh, function. So when you look at the code, so that code is quite huge, actually. Uh, so I believe that uh, the SRV.sysdll is around uh, 300 kilobytes. Uh, so there are still like uh, a few functions 
to, to look at. And so we essentially focused our research on the transaction area. And for example, when you look at this function, uh, which can be called, for example, with an SMB uh, open uh, request, uh, you can see that uh, there are some checks uh, at some point whether uh, the SMB contains some extra arguments. It turns out that uh, in this case, for example, we were not checking correctly if the size of uh, the allocated out data buffer was enough. So we would end up with uh, an out of bound write of um, 20 bytes in X uh, to a pool. Yeah, we don't want that fixed. What else? <clears throat> Something a bit more subtle, let's say. Uh, in the anti transaction code, there were. This code is really complicated. Uh, it's quite ugly to look at, <laughs> if you want my opinion. But anyway, uh, we had a look. And uh, you can see that at some point, uh, the code is making some assumptions on uh, different uh, values uh, set in, uh, in the transaction. And one of them is the set up count field. We haven't talked about that. So at one point, the code was making an assumption on setup count, and at another point, it was making another assumption, but this time based on max setup count. So since the two values uh, are, are different, they are not the same, so we, we had, we had uh, like, yeah, there, there was an issue in that code. So this would typically end up in another pull overflow uh, in, uh, in the code, and of course, we fixed it. What else? Something, something I'd say a bit more subtle, but yeah, when you look at the code for restart write name pipe, there is, uh, this function is quite small, but there is something, uh, it's like it's resetting some, uh, some, um, some values, and, uh, and then you see that it's trying to write something to, um, to, uh, to the, the, param the out parameter buffer. But the thing is that, We've got these fields like max uh, data, max data count, max parameter count. These fields are specifically used to allocate the out parameter and out data buffer. But in that case, there was nothing in that code that was checking if we could actually write data to that out parameter buffer. So in the worst case, we would go off by two here. This is fixed. <laughs> Let's come back to that anti rename function that uh, the shadow brokers have been, uh, well, the shadow brokers, I mean, whoever wrote these eternal exploits have been using. So what is that function? That function <laughs> actually does nothing. Uh, as I told you before, uh, it was just uh, similar to the SMB echo uh, function. It was just uh, echoing the, the original packet that we sent. Um, so what we thought was, for an exploit, this function is amazing. It's amazing. Say that you've got a big transaction and you're coding uh, that anti rename function, and then you use, for example, the out of bound issue that uh, Eternal Romance was uh, using to overwrite uh, some fields in the transaction object. And, uh, since that the original buffer is huge, uh, the server will need two response, uh, at least, well, the server will need to send two packets to a client. And because of that function, there was absolutely no validation on the data count, parameter count, and setup count uh, values. So you could just overwrite these fields and uh, read back like anything you wanted in memory. And this was even worse if you were t uh, thinking about this bug in, uh, in the secondary function, uh, transactions where you would be allocating data and then you, you could specify an offset where you wanted to, uh, to, to write data to, to a buffer. So here we had like an uninitialized memory issue where you could actually choose the offset where you wanted to write data and then dispatch later uh, that object to uh, the transaction function. But nothing uh, was actually initializing uh, the buffer allocated. So what you could do was, for example, uh, target the anti rename function with some uh, large transactions and just uh, constantly set the offset in the secondary transaction to zero so that the entire buffer would be left uninitialized. So this is what we call a heap visualizer <laughs> and a remote one. 
we don't need that feature fixed. <clears throat> What else? Something that I sometimes uh, ask in interview. Um, so in in um, in the, in C, you can define some structures, and uh, in the structures you can have different uh, like uh, variables, uh, different types. And in this function, for example, a snapshot function, uh, you were using a snapshot structure, and this structure uh, had defined a buffer in the end, a, a, a buffer of size one. And it turns out that in some uh, specific case, when snapshot count was set to zero, we would just return that buffer, that, that structure, but without uh, having it fully initialized. So we could be leaking here two bytes to the client that is fixed again. Something a bit more interesting in uh, the IOCTL, um, uh, um, in a function that handles some IOCTL. There was that code where that could, uh, that was used actually to uh, return some data to the client. But that code was actually using a fixed value. And, uh, and in some condition, it was possible to have the server return a smaller buffer than what it was expected. And, uh, and in that case, we would just leak memory from the stack. That's a really interesting feature that unfortunately we don't need <laughs> fixed. <clears throat> Another one, uh, this one uh, in, uh, in the query descriptor SMB. Uh, so as you can see on this, uh, on this picture, at the end of the function, we are setting uh, different uh, values like data count, parameter count, etc. But look at this uh, parameter count set to max parameter count. This doesn't make any sense. We are just re returning a buffer to the client with a, a large and saying that, uh, yeah, we are going to return a large amount of parameters. But this max parameter value, it can be arbitrary. So in the end, we are just going to return an arbitrary amount of data, of uninitialized data to the client. Again, a heap visualizer. We don't need that fixed. <clears throat> one of the last one. Uh, again, something like this uh, in restart NTIOCTL, where you could have, again, like uh, parameter count sent to max parameter count. Yeah, it's gone. And one of my last one, or probably the last one, uh, this uh, function in a restart uh, call name pipe, where in case you were using a very old dialect, uh, you, would, you could actually trigger an, an error and have the code return success without initializing the data count, parameter count, etc. So again, you would be leaking everything in memory. Done. Is that all? Uh, I wish, yeah, I wish it was all. Uh, so I've, I told you that I believe that we fixed around 20 bugs, uh, and we probably fix some over. Uh, even if we want, if we are going to deprecate that protocol, we still support it. Um, regarding now the exploits, um, so I've said that uh, none of these are from the eternal exploits reproduced uh, successfully on Windows 10. Uh, that's true, but you guys are going to tell me, yeah, but there were some exploits made uh, publicly uh, available targeting Windows 10 RS1, for example. And I say, yes, you're right. And uh, it turns out that, yeah, there was one guy who, uh, who successfully managed to exploit uh, Windows 10 RS1. So this is the anniversary update. Uh, and this guy, he, that was very interesting because uh, instead of like, corrupting uh, some stuff in memory and, uh, and redirecting the flow, he just focused on overwriting a token with, uh, with a null token. And so this would give him the full privilege uh, permissions, uh, sorry, the full system permissions on, uh, on the assembly server. So he was able to uh, write some file anywhere on, uh, on the drive. That was quite a good exploit. Uh, I quite like this one. Uh, but still, it took him, uh, it took these guys two months uh, to write um, a correct exploit. I mean, something exploiting RS1, which means that our mediation work, well, it's working. If there is a public exploit that works and it takes you two months to adapt it to uh, one of the most recent builds of uh, Windows 10, then it means that, yeah, we are winning, we are 
well, we need to defend them, but it's it's uh, it's on a good way. And is that all? Well, I believe it's all for me uh, for this talk. So thank you guys for listening. Uh, I hope that you have understood uh, <laughs> some things about this presentation. Um, we, you guys, you know, we are always hiring at Microsoft and specifically at VMSRC. So the job is really cool. Uh, trust me, you see uh, so many things. Uh, so if you if you think that you you've got uh, some some skills about that, yeah, trust me, don't be shy. Uh, just talk to me, and uh, I can probably put in touch uh, with uh, somebody who's uh, who's hiring or. Yeah, uh, so um, the MSRC, so we are split into uh, both the UK and the US. So I'm in the UK, uh, but uh, most of the team is in the US. But still, we, we, are interesting by, we are interested by the Chinese hackers. So guys, yeah, don't be shy. Uh, send your CV. And, uh, this, is, this is a fun adventure. So thank you. Play, you have any any question? Okay, 那我們很感謝Nicholas給我們帶來這個SMB的技術細節。那從中間其實我們也發現就是SMB的一些歷史淵源,還有Windows 10,好Windows 從Windows 10之後的我們改進了很多一些核心的安全架構。那我們再度掌聲,謝謝Nicholas。Thanks guys.